Oh my goodness. Uh, <clears throat> we are on the threshold of uh, an explosion in innovation and crypto is symptomatic of it. Uh, uh, the seeds for what is about to happen were planted during the 20 years that ended with the tech and telecom bubble. Those seeds have been gestating for 20 to 25 years, sometimes 30 years, and are now beginning to blossom. Uh, and that's not even the right word. They're, they're, they are exploding into, into existence. So we think there are five major platforms, 14 different technologies that are all uh, getting ready to move into the sweet spot of their S-curves. And there are going to be convergences between and among these technologies. So you're going to have one S-curve feeding another, feeding another. Uh, and creating explosive energy and explosive growth. And I think in the in the crypto space, uh, we're going to see blockchain technology and artificial intelligence converge and cause explosive reactions. So it's it's pretty exciting. Uh, just to get back to um, investing in the future, when I, when I uh, was trying to explain to someone what I wanted to do before starting ARC, uh, and who's not in our business, he said to me, oh, you mean that in the, the future of investing is investing in the future? And I said, you got it. Well, now, when I started in the business, that's the only that's the only way people thought about investing. And, and then we went through the tech and del telecom bust and then the 08, 09 meltdown. And we ended up with huge risk aversion in the markets and uh, uh, a tendency to invest very much like the broad-based indices out there. Uh, in other words, not adding much more value than the indices themselves. And the indices are where they are because of what has happened historically. The largest companies, the most heavily weighted companies in these indices are there because of their past success. But if we're right, and all of this disruptive innovation is about to explode, well, they are in harm's way. Yes, well, this uh, chart uh, was uh, was drawn by uh, Brett Winton or developed mm -hmm. by Brett Winton, uh, who's our director of research. And uh, he was working with academic literature to try and understand uh, what would be the productivity or the impact on productivity of the combination of these uh uh, platforms. Uh, and what, what he's depicting here is the productivity uplift is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen. We've only, ha we've had uh, multiple platforms evolving at the same time only once before. And that was in the early 1900s, telephone, automobile, and electricity. And uh, that, that world uh, there was a that that was the technologically enabled innovation of the time and, and transformed our world completely. Let me put some numbers on where we are now. In 2019, when we did this chart, uh, we um, we uh, uh, evaluated the market cap around the world associated with truly transformative uh, innovation. That was that year. It was seven trillion dollars. So it was less than ten percent of the global equity market cap. That's public equity. Uh, the next year, last year, that doubled to fourteen trillion, uh, and we did have a very good year last year. We believe that in the next five to ten years, that number is going to north of 100 trillion dollars uh, but what what we're not saying when we so that's the upside uh, the downside will be in the broad based benchmarks which have uh, been beneficiaries of the traditional world order and are now going to be disrupted and disintermediated so in order to su summarize this section about like this explosive innovation what what is the current market holding true that you think the market is fundamentally wrong about? Uh, I think um, 
the the pace of innovation and the convergence uh, between and among these platforms. Uh, most investors have never seen exponential growth. Well, they they recall seeing it once. It was during the tech and telecom bubble, and that ended badly. Uh, and that's why there's been this allergic reaction to innovation and high valuations. Um, most investors have a one-year time horizon, maybe 18 months. We have a five-year investment time horizon. The early years of exponential growth, when we're at low numbers in terms of the base, uh, the numbers don't look that much different from linear growth. But when you uh, go out five years, the difference between exponential, so revenue growth rates in the 25 to 50 percent range per year, and uh, and let's say GDP growth, which might be five percent at best, night and day. Uh, and I think what gives us uh, the differentiation is our starting point. We start from the top down, trying to size markets. And we center our research on something called Wright's Law. Wright's Law is a relative of Moore's Law. Uh, Moore's Law is a function of time. Wright's Law is a function of units. And, uh, and actually, Wright's Law has worked better in the semiconductor industry than Moore's Law itself during the last few years. Uh, and so that's how we get to numbers like... Um, uh, the electric vehicle space, 2.2 million last year, but the costs are dropping to such an extent now that we think that number is going to 40 million, almost half of the uh, global cars sold uh, in five years, actually more like four years now. Uh, no one has that kind of uh, accelerated growth in their models. They've never seen it before, so they're not modeling it in the future. But Wright's Law is a very good guide. Just just to hop in and emphasize this point, because I'm sure Yasin and I both have built these, these right law, Wright's Law models. Um, Kathy's saying, like, as you increase the units of production, there's a certain cost decline curve to that technology. Um, and so that's a lot of ARC's work of being able to predict out five, 10 years, what are the costs of these things going to be based on the, the units produced? Um, there's this other thing that was coming to my mind as Kathy was talking, and Elon Musk has this line of fate loves irony, um, which always messes up my head. But um, when I think about how backward looking a lot of traditional finance has become, that comes at the same time, and the backwards looking is, as Kathy's saying, focusing on indices and investing based on the past. That's happening at the same time that the world is changing at an accelerating rate. And so there is this, this tragic irony that people are more and more backwards looking in their investing, at least institutions are, while you know the opportunity is getting larger and larger in the future. And I think that what, what's great about that actually is it opens up a space for retail. Um, and, you know, ARC is predominantly, I think, retail favored yes. with growing institutional respect. And I think that will only grow over time. But the opportunity is really for retail to catch up to institutions. You guys say front run the opportunity, but it's just retail being future looking while the institutions are backwards looking. There's lots of people who are, are willing to, um, you know, trash what you're doing. And Kathy, you have some haters too. There's an anti Kathy Wood ETF out there. I've heard yes. critics call what you're doing unprofitable tech. That's what they call your your sector. Um, our friend from Real Vision, Raul Paul, uh, was just on recently, and he says part of this is because people are fundamentally afraid of change. Is there something to that? Why do you think there are you know, like the haters of the world um, disparaging the work that you're doing and kind of your method? Um, actually, I feel very comfortable when when I'm in that kind of situation. If everybody loved what we were doing and were ch and were and and they were chasing it, uh, I'd feel much less comfortable. So I'm kind of used to it. I've faced it uh, actually inside the traditional world as well, as I became an otter and otter duck, uh, and my uh, counterparts were becoming more benchmark sensitive. So, you know, it was kind of, uh, it seemed like to them at least, uh, rebellious. Uh, so are they afraid of change? Um, 
I think there's muscle memory associated, uh, certainly at the t- high level management, associated with the tech and telecom bubble. And many equity uh, uh, leaders went down and uh, basically ceded power to the fixed income uh, market. So many of the leaders of financial firms came out of the fixed income world uh, because of the tech and telecom bust. Many uh, equity uh, leaders lost their jobs then. And then again, 08, 09. And so you have this very conservative group of people who really uh, haven't managed equities ever uh, and and uh, actually uh, understand more benchmark sensitivity since that's how that work world's, world works. Um, uh, and I, I suppose this just seems like, uh, again, an odd duck running around uh, with her head cut off. You know, uh, they, they're not willing to look at the kind of research we're doing, which we provide freely out there. In fact, we provide our uh, Tesla model, right? <laughs> and, and to help to educate people saying, look, we've done the research that supports these numbers. And I think the biggest surprise to me is that giving the research away, spoon feeding them with the models has has not changed much. Uh, But I think it will change. We're just going to keep if we're right, if we are right, uh, then those who are wedded to benchmarks are going to lose their jobs.